the best in the world podcast with Richard Parr. It's Wednesday, so that means only one thing. It's a brand new best in the world with Richard Parr. Every week we find out what is the difference that an Olympic champion, a world champion, a world number one or a world record holder does in their life to become the very best at what they do, to reach the pinnacle of their sport. And this week, we have got an Olympic champion who's not only good at one sport, but she's good at two. Kaylee Gilchrist, part of the US water polo team that won gold this past summer in Rio de Janeiro. She's a gold medalist at just the age of 24. She's now setting her sights with success in surfing. A former US national champion, could she be winning gold at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics? Kelly talks about a lot of different things on the show, such as the transferable skills between water polo and surfing, her training schedule, and the precautions the team made for Rio. If you want to know who Kelly is closest to on the US water polo team, her favourite place to visit, and what her music playlist includes, then we answer all of that on this week's Best in the World. Fun chat with her. That is coming up in just a moment. I've got a quick call to action for all of you listeners. If you could please like our page at Sportachino, that's facebook.com forward slash Sportachino. You know, we do this show every single week, the best in the world for Richard Parr, but now on Facebook Live at 8 GMT, we are live with a sports breakfast show. We'd love for you to get involved in the show. You can like us on the Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash Sportachino. If you don't have Facebook, we're also on YouTube as well, and we're also on iTunes. Sportachino is spelled S-P-O-R-T-U-C-C-I-N-O. If you're not sure, please help us with that. All right, let's get to it. Let's get to my interview with Kaylee Gilchrist. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. So, Kaylee Gilchrist, Olympic gold medal winner in water polo, welcome to the best in the world with Richard Parr. So great to have you on the show. So, what have you been up to since that success? Well, it's been pretty nonstop for me. Um, we won August 19th, and I think we flew home, I believe it was the 22nd when we got back to the States. And I've been just nonstop, whether it be, uh, you know, going on doing kind of ex- showing off the medal, doing chats, speaking, appearances, or some fun celebrity trips. Or um, I'm recently going into my professional surfing career, so I've had a lot of surf trips as well. Oh, wow. I'm going to get into that a little bit later. But what's been the most fun trip you've done since then? Um, The most fun, some of the girls and I went out to Vegas to celebrate. So, of course, that was the most fun. And just being reunited with the teammates was great. (laughs) That sounds like trouble. (laughs) (laughs) And is it weird that you have this time just to kind of unwind a little bit? I know you're going to we're going to talk about the surfing and you've got that on your mind as well. But, you know, obviously leading into an Olympic Games, you're probably training at the at your peak and then you've kind of got this downtime. Is it weird? Yeah, definitely. Um, It's been a tough transition period. You know, you're used to going full throttle. You have a schedule every single day, seeing your teammates every single day and, you know, just training for this common goal. And all of a sudden you reach that goal and you come back and it's almost like now what, you know, you've just reached your lifelong dream. You know, it came true and I'm 24 and now I'm like, have so many questions of what I want to do, but I always just have to put things in perspective for me. You know, this is the time to relax, to enjoy and Um, training will start up again, whether it be water polo, surfing, it's right right around the corner. So just enjoy this time as much as I can. And to be an Olympic gold medalist at the age of 24, that's pretty cool. So tell us about that daily schedule. What was that? What was that like? How grueling was it? Um, For me, you know, I look back on it and yeah, it was definitely a grind, but I woke up every morning going to practice, not dreading it. And I think it's just because I'm very passionate about the sport. And um, I really, the past year or two really committed everything to water polo and to this goal. So um, just being able to do that 
was good, but we would wake up, we'd have practice from weights from about seven to eight thirty nine, And then we conditioned in the pool till about nine to 10 30. We have a little three hour break, you know, time to relax, get treatment, eat some lunch. And then we were back in the pool around one thirty to four thirty. and afternoon practices were mainly all water polo. And sometimes we would do some video and some scouting before we hopped in the pool, but it was a majority of just playing, playing the game. Mm. And what was in that lunch? Because obviously you're burning so many calories doing water polo. Yeah, yeah we were pretty fortunate. Um, January of 2016, we had lunch catered to the pool. So that was definitely a great perk. And uh, oh, nice. our, our nutritionist, Sean, did such a great job of, you know, just informing us of what to eat. It was never like a strict diet because, you know, in the end, we are the professional athletes. We choose what we put in our body. But we just definitely had a lot of um, information of what, to eat to make us feel the best and perform the best that we want to want to do. So a lot of times it was a bunch of different types of sandwiches, salads, wraps. Um, you know, it was really good. And, you know, it actually helped save tons of money and save a lot of time What uh, and just hanging out at the pool and having lunch there. Hmm. And I guess sometimes it's nice not to even think about it. You don't have to think about meal prep. You don't have to do any of that organization. I know when you look at some of the top CEOs in companies and stuff, they just wear the most raggedy T-shirts and whatever and the same thing every day because they see it as one less thing to think about. And I guess when you're a professional athlete, you've got so many things on your mind. Is that right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, we, before we, you know, you have to wake up an extra 15 minutes early and doesn't sound like a lot of time to prepare, you know, meals, but when you're getting up that early every single day and it's just that last, last little factor, you know, to not worry about. And I think that was the ultimate goal is just to eliminate all the outside factors. And for us, one of those just happened to be worrying about lunch and, you know, and, or worrying about what to wear, you know, and it was just eliminating a as many outside factors as we could so we could really focus on what was important so let's start at the beginning when did you start playing water polo and when did you realize you were good and when did you realize that you wanted to take this to an olympic level um i started playing water polo when i was eight um my father's a two-time olympic swimmer so i kind of grew up in the pool and you know swimming was definitely not my uh best sport so it's kind of become a running joke in the family but luckily I found water polo and um started you know just playing I realized in high school I was pretty good I made the varsity team as a freshman and started getting recruited to schools and I committed to USC my senior year um I actually really struggled my first year at USC but kind of figured out refound the passion for the sport and really enjoyed it uh from sophomore year on and then the summer of 2013 I got asked by Adam Kukorin, the head coach of the national team, to come try out, you know, train at this little training camp uh, with all the girls. And I think that's the moment when I realized, okay, like, I got this. Maybe maybe the Olympic dream is still there. And I actually kind of turned down that summer because I already had some surf contests uh, scheduled. And I, you know, was willing to give up that dream. And I was like, you know, if you want to invite me back in fall, I'd be more than happy to come back and train. And then you know, when I got the invite back that fall of 2013, I kind of put the blinders on and realized that this was my goal and I wanted to become, you know, an Olympian. And that's kind of, you know, what I was talking about earlier about fully committing. And I think that was the moment when I fully committed. Oh, awesome. So that's when you, when you became really keen on water polo. And what was it like on that first day when you went to the national team? How nervous were you? Yeah, it was pretty nerve wracking. I mean, you, I never did any of the ODP, the Olympic development program, um, at a younger age that many of these girls did. So they had relationships with all these girls, um, just growing up playing water polo and I never did any of the clubs or anything like that. So I kind of came in a little blind, not knowing too many girls and they were all rivals on other college teams at that point I was playing at USC and, you know, so you kind of gain a little like competition, a little hatred for each and every one, but I just came with an open mind and just kind of didn't want to overstep my boundaries or act like I need, you know, I deserved a spot there. I was just working like anyone else and slowly but surely started uh, building relationships with the girls on the team. And, you know, now we're, now we're teammates for life and have grown into great friends. Hmm. And I guess that was really important for when you became an Olympic champion, really that camaraderie between you guys. Yeah. You know, our team did a great job of, embracing everyone you know everyone's differences and I think that's so important we all come from different backgrounds and brought up different ways and we're coached by different coaches so we really uh really it was really important to us to just you know accept everyone and 
I think being able to accept everyone, you just, it made it that much better. And, you know, we were fighting for everyone in the pool and, you know, some, some of the girls I'll be best, you know, I'll be best friends with everyone for life, but some of the girls, of course, I'm closer with than others, but in the water, it didn't matter. We were fighting for each other. Mm. Who are you closest to? Um, there's Maggie Steffens was probably my closest teammate. She, uh, lived downstairs um of my parents house it was pretty cool she <laughs> rented out the studio so we got really close pretty much you know my second sister and then rachel patal and cami craig i'm really close with as well oh that's wonderful so tell us about the day of the final what was going through your mind did you change anything in your preparation and how did it feel when you won that gold medal so the morning it was august 19th and um you know, we didn't change our preparation at all. And it was funny, you want to go into the Olympics and you want to feel different. You want it to be, you know, something special. But for us, it almost felt like another tournament. And I think that just shows how prepared we were. And um, just kind of all the pre- preparation, all the video, all the training, all the trust in our teammates and our coaches. And I think that's why we were so successful in the games. We didn't, you know, psych ourselves out and be like, this is an Olympic and you know olympic tournament this is the olympic gold medal game we just stuck to our daily routines and you know woke up the morning of the 19th we went to practice a little loosen out and you know it was game time and it was versus italy and i remember i was going on the bus and i was listening to this pump up song it's been on my playlist it's called get ready by flip side and i've listened to it for you know 10 years on my pump up playlist <laughs> and i've never noticed the lyrics and it says it talks about brazil and it's like copacabana and ipanema and i was just like oh that's a sign like we're winning this no matter what <laughs> and then we kind of just came out all you know just blazing and to beat the italian team which is a great team by seven goals is just kind of just shows is just a testament to our preparation i believe mm, that's class what else is on that playlist um, I've got, let's check it out. I'm actually on my computer. I can show you or show some of the songs on my playlist. I like more mellow, mellow music to get me pumped up. Okay. Um, I always like Pursuit of Happiness by Kid Cudi, um, Riptide by Vance Joy. Um, I don't know, a little bit of everything. The, the playlist is called Victor, Victorious. Ah. Well, when you're yeah. in the gym, when you do cardio, is it just music or, or will you listen to podcasts or audio books or anything like that? No, for us uh, during gym, it's just, just music. Sometimes it depends on the, you know, how everyone's feeling. Sometimes we'll have a country day or a throwback day or just, you know, today's hits. It always <laughs> changes, but it's just music usually. Oh, is there anyone with really bad music tastes who you groan at when it's their turn to pick? <laughs> I'm not the biggest country fan, but the majority of the team loves the country. So that that's uh, probably my least favorite p- uh, pump up music. The best in the world podcast with Richard Parr. More from Kenny in just a moment, but I want to tell you that this show is brought to you today by Audible. Audible is one of the leading suppliers of audiobooks in the world. 180,000 titles to choose from. Wow. It's a product I personally use. I really enjoy listening to audiobooks. It could be on a commute. It could be on a bus. It could be in the gym. It could be in the walk in the high street. It's all different places you can listen and learn from the very best people in the world like we do on the best in the world with Richard Parr every week and guess what the kind people at Audible are offering you the listener of the best in the world podcast a chance to check out their service for free for nothing for nada gratis for 30 days all you've got to do is go to audibletrial.com forward slash best that's audibletrial.com forward slash best you'll get a free audiobook download and a free 30-day trial to check out their service. I highly recommend it. Like I highly recommend the rest of this interview with the very best in the world, Kaylee Gilchrist. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. You're now the Olympic champion, and you mentioned you're going to take uh, surfing a bit more seriously. T- tell us about where you are in your in your surfing career right now. Yeah, well, I, I started surfing the same age as water polo. I was eight years old, and I was able to balance both sports basically all the way through college. College, it 
water polo demanded a little bit more of a commitment, especially being coached by a uh, Jovan Vavik, who's uh, pretty notorious of being um, pretty strict. And he taught me a lot about commitment and about the sport of water polo. But I, 2010, I was the back-to-back USA champion. I was a part of the USA surf team for about five years and, you know, competed against the world's best. And I had to kind of put it on the back burner for so many years that um, I'm really excited to go out and I'm doing qualifying series events. And the goal is to make the championship tour, um, hopefully in the next few years. And surfing was recently added in the 2020 Tokyo Games. So, you know, the ultimate long-term goal is to make the Olympic team for surfing. Hold on. So I'm going to be interviewing you in 2020 after you've won gold in surfing and you, you'll you be the, the first person I speak to who's, who I've spoken to about water polo and then surfing. So does this mean water polo you're done with? There's no more of that? Um, well, I thought I thought that was the plan, but um, the past few months I realized how much I've missed it and missed the team aspect. But right now it's all surfing and for the year of 2017, it's going to be all surfing, committing, doing everything I can to see you know, just how far I can take my surfing career. And then we'll just have a big reevaluation then and we'll see how things go. Maybe I'll be back in water polo. Maybe I'll continue to surf. But something I've learned is that I am obsessed with the Olympic movement and the Olympics. So I want to be in Tokyo competing for something. And that was my dad's first Olympics in 64. So I think that's just another sign that I got to be there. Mm, that's amazing so how was your olympic experience other than the actual success in the pool winning the gold medal how did you find the village how did you find the opening ceremony how did you find all of rio as a whole um i it was amazing you know i'm a first time olympian so going down there you know you have ideas of you know what to expect but you really don't know until you're in there and the Olympic movement is so real and just being able to walk in the opening ceremonies, chanting USA going through a uh, Mark and stadium, you know, it gives me chills just thinking about, and it was, it was something special and something that I realized that I've always known, but definitely during the Olympics, it's just how much love and support I have for my friends and family, whether the ones that made it down there to cheer me on in person or all my friends and community back home, it was really special just to see who and everyone that was reaching out to me and I'll never be able to thank them enough. Obviously, there were a lot of concerns and fears for people heading to Rio in Brazil, Zika and problems with the water. Were there any precautions that the team made? Um, No, not really. Again, I kind of touched upon it earlier, but we were just focusing on what we could. And those are, you know, in our team, we call them the outside factors. You can't really control all of that and what the media is portraying for Brazil and so we didn't, there wasn't much talk on the team. Um, there wasn't much precautions. We just went down there and, you know, we've been to Brazil before in November as a team and we know how beautiful it is and how great the people are. So we just, you know, knew that when we got down there, it was going to be a lot of the same and the Brazilian people are amazing. And I think they hosted a great Olympic. So we try to take those factors away as much as we could. Okay, fair enough. So obviously, you've got water polos in water and surfing's in water. But other than that, are there any transferable skills between the two that you found have helped either sport? I actually, a lot of people always, you know, are kind of amazed by my answer, because I've been asked that a few times now. But I actually think I've learned more um, mental toughness in surfing. I mean, water polo is notoriously known as being a very mental tough sport and a hard sport but there's just something about being an individual individual sport and having you know so many variables that you can't control in surfing you know you're out there in a heat there's tide wind swell you know the judges and for water polo there's very defined you know you try to score a goal in a net you always play 32 minutes of the game the fouls are the same Sometimes refs might get involved, but I never really seen them to change a game or anything. So I learned how to be mentally tough and deal with all these outside variables that you can't control and just to be able to do whatever you can in in your favor with, you know, what you're given. And I think that's taught me to stay mentally strong and in the moment, which was probably one of my bigger traits that I brought to the water polo team. And I always said, you know, if nothing is slower when you're in the lead surfing you know, a minute can never go by slower. And then when you're down and you're losing and you need a score, it's the fastest minute of your life. <laughs> exactly. Now, water polo can be a pretty tough sport. Have you had many injuries? 
Um, not too many. I've got a couple, you know, a couple black eyes, a couple of elbows, uh, jam fingers seem to be mm. pretty, pretty normal, but I've been pretty fortunate. A couple of the girls have gotten stitches and have gotten some bloody noses, but I have stayed out of that, uh, the injury realm pretty well. I'm pretty safe in the surfing as well. <laughs> Actually, I never been injured surfing until the waves were really good in Newport. I think it was, must've been February of 2015. And I packed my board and went surfing in between double days because I knew the waves were going to be really good. I go out there and I get worked by a set and my fin hits the back of my head and I have to go to the emergency room, oh. 10 staples to the head later. And I call my coach, Adam, like, Hey Adam, I think I'm going to be a little late to afternoon practice. And he kind of, kind of just sat me down when I got to practice. And he's like, you know, I'm not going to tell you not to surf because it's not going to happen, but just be smart. And luckily we weren't in a very intense phase of training, so it had all worked out. But that was probably my biggest injury of surfing. Oh dear, well, fingers crossed you get nothing more like that in the next <laughs> few years. So, you know, you're really busy with your water polo, really busy with the surfing. You obviously went to college as well and juggled everything there. But how do you unwind? How do you relax if you get any time to do any of that? Um, For me, what I've learned is, you know, I just playing sport makes me or working out makes me relax, which sounds kind of, uh, kind of hypocritical, but I just love to, you know, work out and hang out with some friends. And I love to travel. So luckily, my sports both have let me travel around the world. So just being able to see different cultures and learning a about, you know, different people from around the world is really cool. And um, I don't know, I guess when I'm home at Newport, we we'll love to surf and, you know, hang out with my little corgi named Ty and hang out with some friends and family. Oh, lovely. So where's been the favorite place you visited? Um, I think it all depends. For surfing, uh, Indonesia and Fiji were some of my favorite places ever. Um, the people, both people, are both countries are so nice and the ways were amazing and then of course for me in water polo brazil is always going to have a special place in my heart <laughs> yeah amazing yeah a friend of mine is actually about to open a surf camp in bali so i'm gonna have to go to indonesia for the first time and check it out not that i can surf yeah <laughs> i might have to join you yeah sounds good yeah that would be great <laughs> Uh, and I'll, I'll put some details up on my website and, and on this page when i get more details of when they launch it um so awesome. So you, you mentioned your family and you, you mentioned your dad. Did he give you any advice before you headed to Rio? Um, you know, he, it was pretty cool the way he kind of just going through the same process as he did. You know, when I was younger, I thought, yeah, that's cool. He's an Olympic athlete, blah, blah, blah. But as I started going through the same exact thing he was, I gained more respect for what he did. And it was cool to bounce, you know, bounce ideas and bounce you know emotions and thoughts with him and he was always great he kind of knew the right buttons to push to kind of you know frustrate me and push me a little further or you know the right times to just give me the advice but basically the biggest advice was just really embrace it all and you know it flies by and before you know it you're going to be his age pushing you know you could go back and do what I was doing and embrace the teammates and the travel and just take a step away from the sport and just realize like you know where I am and and how I got there and thank the people that kind of got me to the point of where I was. Mm, well, that was good advice because it certainly paid off. Well, Kaylee, just before we go, why don't you tell our listeners how they can continue to follow your amazing life and amazing career and what you're getting up to with surfing and if you do anything more with water polo on social media or any websites or basically anything you'd like to promote on the show. Yeah, I mean, if you guys want to continue to follow me on this journey, uh, I'm probably the best way to follow is through Instagram. My handle is at Kaylee Gilchrist. I uh, love to post photos and keep all my fans, friends, and followers updated. So hopefully the journey continues and I'll have some have some good stories for you in the future. Yeah, I look forward to interviewing you in 2020 when you're an Olympic <laughs> surfing champion. Kaylee Gilchrist, thank you so much for your time today and thank you for being the best in the world. Thank you, Richard Parr. Have a good day. The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr. Thanks, Kaylee, for appearing on this week's podcast. It was great to learn from her 
we have got another water polo player coming up in the next few weeks stay tuned to my twitter page at richard underscore par for more details on who that might be we've got more great guests coming up on the best in the world but also the whole back catalog is on itunes and it's also at richardparr.net take a look at all of that plus if you've got any comments let us know on that twitter page let us know on the website and also let us know on the facebook page best in the world with richard parr we'd love to get your feedback on the show any questions you'd like us to ask future guests or any guests you'd like to hear from let us know and we will try to get them on the best in the world well thank you so much for listening to this week's show we'll be back next wednesday where we interview another talented sports star or athlete because of course they are the best in the world The Best in the World podcast with Richard Parr.